But why do not our covenants oblige us to abide in these? Because, says Mr. Curry, they were not in being when our covenants were framed. But was not that system of pure and sound doctrine, that order of government, worship and discipline, held forth from the word of God in our confession of faith, etc., in being when our national covenant was framed? I, affor I affirm that our subordinate standards, as they were composed by the Westminster Assembly, contain on the matter the very same system of pure and sound doctrine, that order of government, worship and discipline, which has been received and embraced by the Church of Scotland from her Reformation, and which was sworn to in our national covenant. And if Mr. Curry can show the contrary, he may then accuse me of writing what is not matter of fact. Likewise, our confession of faith, form of church government, etc., are received and embraced by the several acts of assembly adopting the same as parts and branches of that uniformity sworn to in the solemn league and covenant. And Mr. Curry cannot refuse that the Confession of Faith, Form of Church Government, and Directory for Worship had been received by the Church of Scotland before the Solemn League and Covenant was received, anon 1649. Therefore, it is a very great mistake in Mr. Curry to call it no worse to accuse me in the above manner of asserting in this place what is not matter of fact. In the second section of this first chapter of the defense, I give several instances from his essay wherein I show that the question is misstated by Mr. Curry. I shall in this place give two or three instances from his vindication to show that he has not entered into the true state of the question and that he constitutes or excuse me and that he continues to misstate the same. I observe the defense, page thirty nine, that the author of the essay misstates the question when he affirms that violent intrusions were the chief ground of complaint in the year seventeen thirty three, when our secession from the judicatories was first declared. Upon this, mister Curry, in his vindication, page thirty eight, appeals to Mr. Erskine's synodical sermon when he says, The great thing complained of is the Act of Assembly, 1732, and the settling of ministers and violent intrusions. Granting it is true that Mr. Erskine in his sermon chiefly complained of intrusions, does it therefore follow that the brethren stated their secession mainly upon violent intrusions? But, says Mr. Curry, it is evident to a demonstration from what is said in their state of the process page 78, where it is said, quote, Violent intrusions are the main ground at present of Mr. Erskine's testimony, as well as of his brethren's adherence unto him, as is plain from the terms in which both his protest and their adherence are conceived, unquote. If the reader will believe Mr. Curry, his assertions are frequently self-evident, or evident to a demonstration, and yet I can assure the reader that there is no such thing asserted in the place of the state of the process above directed unto, that is, that violent intrusions were the chief ground of the complaint. As the words above quoted do plainly refer to the protest entered against the Assembly 1733, so that protestation was expressly for liberty to testify against the Act of Assembly 1732, or the like defections upon all proper occasions. And one may evidently see that violent intrusions are one thing, and liberty to testify against these or the like defections is another thing. The chief thing that was, the com that was complained of at that time by the said protest was the shutting the mouths of ministers by mere church authority from testifying faithfully and freely against steps of defection. This is what the reasoning and the state of the process turns upon, as one may see who compares the words above quoted with the preceding page. As Mr. Erskine, in his synodical sermon, testified particularly and expressly against the Act 1732, so this gave the first rise to the Act and Sentence of the Assembly 1733, whereby he was rebuked for, rebuked for impugning Acts of Assembly and Proceedings of Church Judicatories, and the above sentence of rebuke was the chief ground of the protestation that was entered for liberty to testify against the Act 1732 or the like defections. Likewise, their protestation entered before the Commission, November 1733, wherein their secession is declared, mentions the following grounds of the same, that is, that the judicatories were carrying on a course of defection from a reformed and covenanted principles, and particularly were suppressing ministerial freedom and faithfulness in testifying against the present backslidings of this church, and inflicting censures upon ministers for witnessing by protestations and otherwise against the same. Thus the reader may see, from what is above, that the chief ground of complaint was not violent intrusions, and that our secession was never founded upon any one step of 
defection considered abstractly and by itself, but upon a complex course of defection carried on with a high hand by the present judicatories. Hence, although violent intrusions were justly complained of, yet the first and immediate point upon which the secession was stated was the suppressing of ministerial freedom as above. And therefore, I still affirm that it is a misstating of the question when Mr. Curry asserts that violent intrusions were the chief ground of the complaint. Mr. Curry goes on in the Vindication, page 39. When, says he, never a word of Professor Simpson's damnable errors, never a sentence in all Mr. Erskine's synodical sermon and at them. And after a quotation from a paper of mine entitled, A Discourse Concerning Some Prevailing Evils of the Times, from whence he alleges the brethren could formally make some apology for the Church of Scotland as well as others, Mr. Curry adds, but now the brethren have other designs to carry on than their impressions as to the evil of Professor Simpson's errors were like other folks, etc. Here again, Mr. Curry runs out into his bitter and uncharitable heart judgings. He speaks as if the concern we have expressed about doctrinal truths did flow from a principle for carrying on our own designs. But I shall leave Mr. Curry to such railings as I find here, and in the following page only I must observe that when he affirms that then there was never a word of Professor Simpson's damnable errors, if he is not mocking at the concern the brethren profess for these, he is surely writing at random, for he cannot but know that the affair of the doctrine was particularly noticed in the several contendings that were before our secession from the judicatories, as I have shown in the introduction to the defense. And particularly, Mr. Curry cannot but know that when the process against the protesting ministers was upon the field, they did, in their representations given in to the commission August 1733, take particular notice of Mr. Simpson's damnable errors and of the conduct of the judicatories in that important matter. We did not at that time confine our testimony to violent intrusions, but did upon the matter take in what has been complained of in former intrusion, instructions, excuse me, representations, and petitions. And in November thereafter, the judicatories thrust us out from communication with them, with our above testimony against them in our hands. As for what he alleges, that there was never a sentence in all Mr. Erskine's synodical sermon against Mr. Simpson's damnable errors, I shall only refer Mr. Curry to the first of the five last directions given in that, in that excellent sermon, and he will see the contrary. As for Mr. Curry's propositions that are laid down in his essay, second chapter, I can well refer my reader to what I have said in the defense, chapter 1, section 2, and he may compare what is said there with Mr. Curry's Vindication, chapter 4, section 2, where the reader may see with his own eyes that Mr. Curry has never taken off the force of what I have observed, particularly upon the ambiguity of some of his propositions and also his perverting the state of the question. As for instance, when he proves his fifth proposition from some of Mr. Shields' words, Vindication, page 45, who says, quote, We may keep fellowship with the true church, though in many things faulty and corrupt, as all churches are in some measure in this militant state, unquote. This is what I do not refuse. But Mr. Curry might have known that the question upon the field betwixt him and me is, if this national church as she is represented in her present judicatories is a true church, as the terms are used in our Reformed confessions. Likewise, when he tells us in his fifth proposition, quote, that we are not to separate from a true church of Christ, though her faults and corruptions be many, unquote, I grant him, defense, page 45, that if by faults and corruptions be meant personal defects and blemishes in the walk and practice of church members, that these are not ground for separation from a true church. But I add, quote, that if by faults and corruptions he meant dangerous errors or gross scandals which a church refuseth to purge out, notwithstanding of warnings and admonitions given her, or defections and backslidings carried on in her ecclesiastical capacity, from, from points of reformation once attained unto, then I say his above proposition is what we used to call a begging the question, unquote. Unto this, Mr. Curry replies in his vindication, page 45, I say, this is a slander upon his mother church. It seems we must take his say for sufficient proof. But these and like confident assertions are nothing to Mr. Curry. He adds, granting the truth of what is alleged, quote, in the church of Corinth there was a gross error and scandal, yet the apostle commanded to keep communion with that church instead of enjoining separation from her, unquote. Since Mr. Curry continues to make this one of his commonplace arguments, I shall here notice, once for all, that I have proved in the defense, page 53, that the church of Corinth was a reforming church, 
and that she took with the apostolic warnings and admonitions given her. To which Mr. Kerr replies in his vindication on page 56, quote, But then, how long it was between his writing of his first and second epistles is uncertain, and how long before writing his first epistle that error had been among some in that church is also uncertain, unquote. But this is mere shift and evasion, for whether the time was long or short, in any of the cases mentioned, tis the same thing to me, in regard that it stands good what I affirm, that the church of Corinth was in her ecclesiastical capacity a reforming church upon the admonitions given her. And this Mr. Curry himself is obliged to acknowledge when he says, I grant it is not improbable these office bearers did discharge their duty with success. Consequently, there can be no argument drawn from the gross scandal and capital error that was found among some in that church to continue in conjunction with such judicatories as refuse to be reformed after the ordinary means have been used to reclaim them. Before I proceed to give other instances in his misstating of the question, I must observe that when I read the title of the third chapter of Mr. Curry's essay, wherein he proposes to instance some things that are just ground for fasting, mourning, and lamentation, yet are not sufficient causes of separation from a church, I expect that Mr. Curry would have made a free and faithful enumeration of some, or at least of the manifold grounds of mourning and lamentation in our present times, yet they are all passed over by him in deep silence. Only he calls on the Act of Assembly 1732, excuse me, he calls the Act of Assembly 1732 a bad act, and makes some acknowledgment that there may be ground to lament over a dead ministry in many places. Though the Lord Jesus has been blasphemed, though his supreme deity and the deity of the Holy Ghost has been impugned, though the operations of the Holy Spirit have been ridiculed and burlesqued through a scheme of dangerous error, connected with an imprudent denial of the federal headship of the first Adam, has been vented, and though this scheme has been maintained at the bar of our judicatories, and though the judicatories have not lifted up the standard of a particular and express testimony against the above gross abominations, and though they have never found that they deserved a place and room in causes of public fasting and humiliation, likewise, though the judicatories have lifted up their authority and power above the authority of the King of Zion, in the Act 1732, and in the Act 1733, against the protesting ministers and against the ministers of Dumfriesland. Though they have scattered and broken the heritage of God, and though all these are grounds of fasting, mourning, and lamentation, yet not one word of them in a chapter wherein his professed design is to instance some things that are ground for mourning and lamentation, only he calls, as I have observed, the Acts 1732 a bad act. Yet he nowhere in this chapter reckons it a cause for mourning. Upon this, says Mr. Curry, in his vindication, page 58, quote, if I reckoned it bad, it was as much as if I had said it was a cause of mourning, for I know nothing in a church which is bad or evil, but what is to be mourned over. And, says he, I know of no venial sins, unquote. Neither do I know of any venial sins more than he. But I know that some things may be bad in a church, because in some circumstantial cases they may be expedient and not for edification, which yet are not in themselves absolutely sinful. And therefore, if Mr. Curry had dealt faithfully in the chapter wherein his professed design is to instance the grounds of fasting and humiliation, he ought plainly to have told his reader that the said act was contrary to the authority of the king of Zion, and absolutely sinful in itself, and that the procedure of judicatories and the settlement of ministers to, the, to this very day, in the terms of the said act, though now repealed, is a practical justifying of the same, and that both these were and are just grounds and causes for fasting, humiliation, and mourning. Mr. Curry likewise tells his reader that in the essay, pages 30 and 32, that is, in another chapter than this upon which my above observe is made, he acknowledges that there is ground to lament over the compliance of judicatories with patronages. What then? Tis not to be found amongst his instances of humiliation mentioned in his third chapter? Here was the place where he should have told such Scotland's sins and the sins of the Church of Scotland if he had answered the title he gives to his chapter. But the truth is, if he had dealt freely and faithfully upon this head, he would have been hard put to it to have proven that the secession from the present judicatories is a schism or groundless separation, and therefore it was safest for him to wrap it all up in some smooth generals in the manner he has done in the chapter mentioned.